please stand in body, room, and spirit, and join me in our call to worship. Blessed are those who revere the Lord. Blessed are those who greatly delight in God's commandments. They rise in the darkness as a light for the upright. They are gracious and merciful and righteous. It is well with those who deal generously. Who can their affairs with justice. They have distributed freely. They have given to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Please join us in hymn 223. <laughs>
have a few holes around it, so I'm good. Thank you for that. Okay. It sounded very good. How are you all doing today? Good. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear it. Listen, I, I thought I might tell you a story. Do you all want to hear a story? Sure. All right. Now, this is a story. It's a folk tale from China, and it's about a little boy who lived in a kingdom, all right? And the emperor of that kingdom didn't have any children, and he was getting older, and they were like, well, who's going to replace the emperor when he ends up, you know, passing on? And so the emperor had an idea, and he said, let's get all of the children together in the kingdom, and we'll make a test, and we'll put the children to a test, and then we'll choose who should be the emperor when I go, okay? And so he got all the children together, and the little boy was excited because everybody wanted to be emperor. And they came into the town square, and the emperor gave everybody a flower pot filled with dirt and a seed. And he said, I want you all to plant your seeds, and then we're going to come back here in a year, and we'll see what has grown. And that will help me determine who should be the next emperor. Okay? And so everybody took their pots and their dirt and their seed, and they went to the back to their homes, and they planted it, and time started to pass, and the little boy's seed did nothing. All of his friends started sprouting, right? Some of them were sprouting into uh, bushes that had berries that were delicious. Some of them sprouted into flowers that were very beautiful to look at. Some of them sprouted into the beginnings of trees that would be big and strong. But his seed didn't do anything. It didn't sprout at all, and he was very discouraged. And he thought to himself, ah, I don't think there's even a point in me trying to win this competition anymore. Nothing is growing. Right. Well, the year came, and everybody met back in the town square, and the little boy was not even thinking about going, but he was curious who would be the next emperor. So he took his pot, and he went to the town square. And just like everyone else, he set it out before the emperor, and the emperor came, and he looked at everyone's plants, and he was stroking his beard and nodding. And he came to the little boy, and he saw there was nothing. And you know what the emperor did? He smiled, right? And he said, do you know that before I gave everyone their seeds, I baked them in an oven so that they would die? Right? And so everyone's seeds wouldn't grow. And he said, you are the only one who is being honest. And that is important for an emperor to be. And he said, you are the only one who is brave because you came with nothing. And that is important for an emperor to be. And he said, so I think you are going to be the next emperor. All right? And I like that story, and I think it ties into scripture for today. Right? Because everybody in the town thought that their plant should be beautiful or should be strong or should make fruit. But the emperor was looking for something different. Right? The emperor was looking for something more important than that. Okay? And that's how Jesus looks at us. Right? There might be people who look better than us. There might be people who have more money than us or are more successful. But those aren't the things that Jesus is looking for. He's looking for something more important. All right? So let's pray and ask God for help. I'll say some words and you repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God help, us help us not to be too worried, to be too worried about, worldly about worldly things, but instead, instead to be worried, to be worried about, the things about the things that truly please you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, now we can go on down to children's worship. Thank you. I'm coming down here and doing it with you. Daddy, daddy, daddy.
as God is glorified by the prayer of the anthem, may God also be glorified by the proclamation of his word. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come before you in the same spirit that is expressed by the Apostle Paul when he declares to the church at Corinth that we have with us the mind of Christ. We pray that by the indwelling of your spirit, you will once again bless us in the same heart and mind that was in Christ Jesus, that we may hear your word, that it may be written within our souls, that it may take root within us and grow to be the embodiment of your love and grace made known in Christ living in us. May we be empowered by the words that you speak to us this day, that we can go forth and be that grace for the world, not by our merits, but by the merits of your Son. May we have the mind of Christ. This we pray in Christ's most holy name. Amen. Our scripture lection for this morning are two. Uh, all, they're, uh, uh, the epistle reading and the gospel reading in our lectionary for the day. Uh, I'll be preaching from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 16, but I want to supplement that with uh, uh, a, a first reading from the gospel. Uh, this is uh, the gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. This is a continuation. Jesus is still preaching in, in uh, Matthew's gospel, in the Sermon on the Mount. He has just uh, offered to the disciples who gathered on the hillside um, words that we traditionally refer to as the, uh, the Beatitudes. Now he's going to continue in that vein by telling his disciples that they are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. And this is a you plural, meaning that it is not something that he's charging each individual to be. He is saying that we as the community of faith we as the church, we as the, the disciples, <coughs> are this for the world. Not to become this, that this is who we are in the proclamation of Jesus Christ. So let me, <coughs> I will tie that into the sermon, though I'm primarily preaching from 1 Corinthians. But uh, first listen, if you will, to Matthew chapter 5. Listen for the word of God. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can, it, how can its uh, saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. <coughs> you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. People do not light a lamp and put, under it, put it under the bushel basket. Rather... They put it on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works <coughs> and give glory to your Father in heaven. <coughs> Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill for truly I tell you, even heaven and earth pass away. Not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And now, my Christian friends, <coughs> this reading from the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Paul is dealing with a, a community of Christians who are not living by the Injunction of Jesus Christ to be the salt of the earth, to be the light of the world. He is, Paul is writing to a church that is 
prize, it, it, it prides itself on the fact that it considers itself to be spiritually informed. Highly spiritual people driven by the wisdom of spiritual things. And Paul very quickly points out how immature they really are in believing in their own spirituality. He is going to show them that there is only one spirituality, one which is derived from the Spirit of God, one which manifests itself in, as he calls it, the mind of Christ. Once again, listen for the Word of God. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the testimony of God to you with superior speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were made not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet, among the mature, we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age, or the rulers of this age, who are being destroyed. But we speak God's wisdom, a hidden mystery, which God decreed before the ages for our glory, and which none of the rulers of this age understood for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what human knows what is truly human except the human spirit that is within? So also no one comprehends what is truly God's except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God. So that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we speak of these things in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. For those who are unspiritual do not receive the, gift, the gifts of God's Spirit, for they are foolishness to them, and they are unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Those who are spiritual discern all things, and they are themselves subject to no one else's scrutiny. For, what has, for, for who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Amen, and may God give us to understand this reading of his holy word. This is the word of the Lord. Be Several things at work in Paul's letter. It's, it, uh, uh, first and foremost, I think uh, I want to address in the way Paul speaks to these uh, Corinthian Christians, this notion that has come down the pike in Christianity about a, um, about a duality of, uh, of wisdoms. Um, you heard me talk a little bit about this last Sunday when, when I spoke about how it is that Paul is not talking about um, uh, human wisdom as being uh, nothing and that God's wisdom is everything. He's, simply, he's just talking about uh, wisdom compared to wisdom. Paul is not disparaging human wisdom. That said, Christians have often read it as though wisdom, human wisdom, is something we need to check at the door and simply live by faith, blind faith, and not have to think ever again. Check your brain at the door. Welcome to Christianity. That's a lot of the way that Christians have been, uh, the Christian faith has been portrayed for 2,000 years. Paul is not thinking that way. A lot of, uh, and this has permeated the way a lot of Christians have thought with regard to uh, the this worldliness in which we live. 
It's even been reflected in some of our favorite hymns. You hear me criticize it, I know, and I'm gonna, I receive flack for it, but I've gotta say it. Um, there are some Christian hymns that just talk about simple escapism. The idea that somehow or other, this world is just um, uh, nothing but scrap. Uh, that it is just so ruined, so tainted, so messed up by human sin that there is nothing redeemable about it. Uh, it's just uh, filled with graft and corruption, and all we're doing while we're here is just biding our time until we die so that we can fly away uh, 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 by and by and, uh, and just live forever in heaven and leave all of this, this junk, I'll use another word, uh, all this stuff alone <laughs> behind. Paul is not thinking that way. Is that, that, um, you know, I know it's a lovely hymn, uh, when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. It's a type of escapism, uh, saying that, uh, that this world, why even bother with this world? Let, eat, drink, and be merry, right? Just, just suck up the resources of the earth because, quite frankly, there's nothing redeemable about it. Uh, and we're going to be leaving this world anyway, right? Uh, so let's just go ahead and just uh, ruin the earth, uh, suck up all of its riches for our own benefit, because it's of no use. The world is a terrible place. That's how we Christians have often interpreted. That is not the biblical model, and it's not the way Paul thinks, my Christian friends. One of the great struggles across the history of the church has been how to value creation, how to value the world in which we live. Sounds like Paul might be... Uh, um, uh, offering some uh, deprecation of the world by talking about the world's wisdom compared to God's wisdom and power. If one goes to the extreme, one might say that the world either has always been corrupt and is deficit, or has become corroded by sin and evil, that salvation is, uh, of the world is just impossible, that simply extricating us from the earth is the only thing that can happen in terms of our salvation. Paul's view of the world has indeed been um, offered up not as a sign of, of an irredeemable uh, corruption. Yes, Paul does believe the world is corrupt. I believe the world is corrupt. It's very difficult for you to live in the world and not see its corruption. Yes, the world is corrupt. It is not beyond redemption. And it is not beyond, uh, it, is not, it is not to be escaped. The world is to be redeemed. This is what Jesus Christ is about. God created the world and pronounced it good. The world is good. At least by God's creation. Do we mess it up? Most definitely. There are hymns that I think wonderfully do collect uh, to, uh, us and call us together into the notion that all of creation travails in waiting for Christ to come and redeem us because in our redemption, creation <coughs> celebrates. Thank God those messy human beings aren't around messing us up anymore. Creation looks forward to our redemption. The redemption of humanity is the redemption of creation itself. This is the model for which Paul is speaking. The world is not ultimately to be escaped, as some talk. Those who hold with Paul, those who think with Paul, that creation is God's and therefore good, and that therefore all of creation is good, must make the choices as adopted and redeemed children of God, what we're going to do with this world. Are we going to simply abuse it, knowing that we're going to escape? Or are we going to be, as God has said from the very beginning, have dominion over it, take care of it, till it, take to, to care for the earth, to care for creation, to care for the beauty of all that God has made? That's our job. And if we have indeed been redeemed by Jesus Christ, that puts the choice on us. Are we going to assume responsibility for the world that God has placed in our care? 
or are we simply going to ignore it, exploit it, and abuse it? There are wonderful things that God has given us in creation, and we should enjoy them. But we need not abuse it, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. No. That is not the view of the world that Paul presents. And how we Christians have come to think that it is mystifies me. But I think at the core is what Paul is saying to these Corinthian Christians. He's saying that if they are thinking such ways, that they are not engaging in the spirit. They are not spiritual. They are not moved by the spirit of God. They are being moved by some other spirit, Paul is saying. You know, it's interesting uh, to, to note, if you take a look at all of Paul's letters, take a look at all of his letters, you know um, a word that he never uses in his letter is Christian. The word Christian never appears in any of Paul's letters. Never appears in his letters. And I, I can tell you why, and historically we know why. Uh, it's because the word Christian didn't come into use in the, uh, in the uh, uh, middle uh, first century when Paul's writing. Uh, the word Christian is uh, a much later adaptation. And believe it or not, uh, the term Christian uh, is a term of derision that the enemies of Christianity were placing upon it. It, was, um, uh, it, were, it, it, it comes from uh, uh, the Roman persecution of Christians that they would start talking about these followers of Jesus Christ. They would call them Christians, meaning little Christs implying that they deserve the same kind of treatment that happened to Jesus. These, these little Christ, they should be crucified too. That's where the term originally starts. And you know what? Christians in the second century embraced the term. They took it on, saying, yes, we proudly deserve what happened to Jesus Christ. Christians take on that name as little Christ. Paul never uses the term. What modern Christians call Christians today, Paul calls spiritual persons. He calls them spiritual persons, persons who are in the spirit, persons who are possessed by the Holy Spirit, those who receive the Holy Spirit. So Paul's primary definition of, of the believer is that person who's in the Spirit. Likewise, the, the, uh, the reception of the Spirit is, for Paul, the hallmark of entry into the community. Paul, uh, Paul doesn't deny the fact that, that receiving the Spirit might be an individualistic experience. An individual may receive the Spirit and somehow or other be in Christ. But, he all, but most of the time when he uses the term, he's talking about it communally. The Spirit inundates us as a community. And think about it. If it is God's Spirit that I have, that you have, that we all have, then it's not just me standing here alone in my faith. I'm united to you in the Spirit of God. We are interwoven with each other in the Spirit of God. Paul doesn't think individualistically like we Americans do. Paul thinks collectively. We belong to each other because we belong to God. And we are so knit together by that spirit, the spirit of God. Many modern Christians are spirit poor. I'll say it, we are. Many of us are spirit poor. <coughs> Paul and his earliest followers were spirit rich. It is fair to suppose that the difference lies not in the Spirit's um, uh, having disappeared. The Holy Spirit hasn't gone anywhere. The problem is with modern believers. Our failure to note, to appreciate, and to cultivate the Spirit at work in us. Paul's going to give us plenty of examples of the Spirit at work. 
And uh, that, that's going to be coming, by the way. I'm reading through 1 Corinthians. It's, uh, it's coming. In 1 Corinthians, especially chapter 3, he's going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit and, and how it plays out with every individual doing his or her part for the community. Everyone is different. Everyone experiences the Holy Spirit differently. But it is that Holy Spirit which weaves us together into one body, the body of Christ, the mind of Christ. That's how he ends this. And it's, to me, the most powerful statement he could make to any of us who somehow or other think that, that, that our spirituality is a private matter, that all it's about is just me receiving the Holy Spirit so I can receive my salvation and escape this world. As though Christianity were nothing more than just a fire insurance to get away from the flames of hell. This is not the Christianity that Paul believes. It's not this individualized thing which means that somehow or other I come into church, I get the Holy Spirit, I get my salvation, now you folks get yours. We're part of it together. We have to be together. It's the Spirit of God. I can't have it without you being in it also. The most amazing thing, my Christian friends, is when Jesus Christ comes into our lives. As gracious as that is, the problem is he brings all of his friends with him. He brings all of us together. It's not just enough for me to bask in the glory of Jesus Christ. To be in Christ means I'm in you also. You're in me. We belong to each other. Warts and all. Who knows the mind of God? The Holy Spirit. My Christian friends, if you experience the love of God at any point in your life, if you experience that grace, if you experience mercy when you should be condemned, you are walking in the heart of God, the mind of God. You are in the spirit of God. That is a great thing. Let us all walk together. Let us be united together. As Paul says here at the close, may we have the mind of Jesus Christ. Amen and may God bless this witness to the glory of his name. Christian faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered <coughs> his life, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. service of worship that we're blessed to have a moment for mission, uh, and we actually have two, and I'm going to start by inviting um, uh, our scout representatives uh, to come forward. I'm sorry, what is your name, sir? I'm sorry? Nathaniel. Uh, Nathaniel, uh, that's a great biblical name. Uh, so, um, I'm going to invite uh, Nathaniel uh, um, to come forward, and I guess uh, Jim, you'll speak afterward, is that right? Uh, okay, so uh, if you would come and share a word with us about scouting, I, we would be most grateful. Senior Patrol Leader of Troop 41 this year. I would like to take a few minutes of this Scout Sunday to tell you what the Troop has done in 2022 and plans to do in 2023. 2022 was a busy year for the Troop, with continued service projects, Scout advancements, and fun had by all members of the Troop. During the year, we had the following events occur. Four of our Scouts achieved the highest rank in Scouting, that is, the Eagle Scout rank. Those Scouts are as follows. Brandon Long. Sam Randall, Lennon Higginbotham, and Orion Lee. The troop, with the support of the congregation and other community sponsors, spent time in a hard-hit area of eastern Kentucky helping with flood cleanup as well as other local community service projects. In 2022, the troop attended Camp Daniel Boone near Boone, North Carolina, where numerous scouts achieved various merit badges and ranks. Along the way, they made various new friends from other states and countries. In 2023, our troop has many great adventures planned and many more achievements to be achieved. The, the following is just a few of these. Several of our scouts are on their way to achieving their Eagle Scout rank. We do plan to return to Camp Daniel Boone for summer camp this year. We have a number of scouts who will be returning to the Florida Keys at the BSA Seabase. We have numerous service projects and community projects in the planning stages for this year. In closing, on behalf of Troop 41, we would like to thank all of you, the congregation, for your continued support of our troop and the support of Scouts BSA. Thank you, and have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone, for allowing us to be here today and share this day with you. I echo everything Nathaniel said. Uh, one of the things that we teach our scouts throughout the whole program are life skills. It could be uh, oratory skills for presentations. It could be first aid. It could be cooking. It could be packing, backpacking, getting ready for getting ready for the rest of life. <clears throat> Something you will notice from our scout troop is they may come in very quiet sit in a corner, you know, not say a lot, but as they progress through their scouting career, they will be up here smiling, happy, talking to you. One of the things our Eagle Scout project does is, is teach them project management, uh, skills to relate to people. So you guys are doing a great job of supporting us. If you're ever here on a Tuesday night, swing in. 
Uh, you'll see scouts running around with bandages around their head or carrying themselves on stretchers, maybe working on their knots, getting ready for, getting ready for campouts. <clears throat> One of the events that Nathan alluded to was the support you gave us as we went down to Hazard to help with the cleanup uh, after the floods. Uh, we rolled in there late on a Friday night. It was dark. We set up camp, really didn't know what to expect. And um, woke up the next day, just devastation. Uh, there wasn't anything left standing. Everything was washed away. <laughs> These guys in front of you donned their rubber, blue, rubber boots, rubber gloves, shovels, and dug in. Uh, they cleaned out houses, they cleaned out trailers, they cleaned out yards, and when they were done, it looked almost as good as it was before the, before the floods. So, give them a big round of applause, and... <coughs> and, and yourselves for supporting us. The, the cleaning supplies, the food, the clothing, the uh, utensils, the shovels helped us so much, and we left that down there for the members of the community in, in Hazard and the surrounding areas. And we couldn't do it without you guys. We couldn't. Uh, we thank you very much, and if I were to say anything else, it would be completely under what Nathan presented to you. So again, thank you, and we enjoy being here, and look forward to staying with you in the years to come. Let me also uh, uh, thank the Scouts for allowing us to uh, uh, be a part of your mission and ministry uh, uh, together. Uh, this is one of the reasons that we consider the Scouts part of our missions in the church. An excellent example of, that you have given, heartwarming example of uh, the, uh, the love of Christ made known uh, in uh, in the values of what uh, you promote in scouting. Nate, uh, Nathaniel and uh, Jim, thank you so much. And uh, for, Troop 401, thank you. Um, David uh, uh, Coleman is ready to present for us another moment for mission in the Five Cents a Meal offerings. David, thank you. Thank you, Curtis. Uh, together with um, hundreds of Presbyterian congregations across the United States, this congregation participates in a program that we call Five Cents a Meal we would collect quarterly, four times a year, an offering to help uh, hunger causes. Part of the offering remains in our community uh, and our uh, partner mission alongside that goes along with this offering is the Grace Now Food Bank just down the street. Uh, so a portion of our offering today, our quarterly offering will go to Grace Now. A portion will then be allotted to the Presbyterian Hunger Program based in Louisville at the denomination's headquarters in Louisville, Kentucky. And um, the Presbyterian Hunger Program operates globally. It is one of the most innovative and creative programs in the world that, to, to help uh, on, on hunger issues internationally. I was just reading about some of their amazing things that they are doing. They are partnering with groups in Yemen, which has been beset by civil war and famine recently, as many of you know, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, they do creative things like working with coastal communities and, and developing uh, resources for more efficient fishing, right? Uh, and, and making sure that the, the, the nets and, and, the, and the equipment uh, are, are both sustainable um, and, and helping communities to become self-sufficient. Uh, and um, also providing goats to those communities uh, that produce milk uh, and, and uh, very culturally sensitive ways of, of making and helping communities become more self-supporting. So I ask that you give generously uh, to the Five Cents a Meal offering today uh, to help all of these causes. Thank you. Again, David, thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderfully insightful the way we are able, uh, in, even with just a few things like Five Cents, make, a, I hope, a difference in the world. So thank you. Let us come before God in prayer. Gracious God, again, we give you thanks for the gift that you have given us in your Holy Spirit, which unites us to you and to one another. 
We pray that you will let that spirit be for us, as Christ calls it, the salt of the earth, the light of the world. May your spirit be that illumination, that, that savor that goes forth in us to make a difference. Even as we declare ourselves Christian, in truth make us spiritual persons, united to you, united to one another, in love, in hope, in charity. This we pray in Christ's most holy name. He who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this point in our service of worship, my Christian friends, we are uh, always blessed to recognize what God has done for us in giving of himself in Jesus Christ, uh, that we give of ourselves also to God in reflection of that love. And it's just a reflection uh, because we can never give enough to recognize what God has given uh, to us. Uh, and uh, our giving uh, symbolizes the continued ministry of Jesus Christ before the world. So uh, my understanding also is that this might be a rare time that the, the Crumps are not going to be playing Usher today. Is that, do I understand that correctly? That the, uh, the Scouts I hear are going to offer themselves as, uh, as our Ushers this day. Again, thank you to Troop 401. Uh, so as we take the time during the meditation uh, of the, uh, the offertory to meditate on our giving, May we also be mindful of what God has done for us.
for all that you've done for us in your Son. Send us forth into the world, always ready to express this gratitude, that all might know your love and grace. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Christian friends to go in peace, live as free people, serve the Lord rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and always. <laughs>